What happened to the XB-70 Valkyrie? There are over 12,000 pounds of titanium in this airplane. The two-man crew will sit side by side. The crew station in this position is about 20 feet above the ground. The purpose of the XB-70 program was to enhance nuclear deterrence. It was meant to be a high-speed, high-altitude nuclear bomb delivering aircraft, and that was its role in the early part of the Cold War. It was an early part of the so-called triad, bombers, submarines, and land-based ballistic missiles. Let's discuss the canards on the XB-70. They're a unique design feature, contributing to the aircraft's overall geometry. The canards solve a crucial stability problem between the low speed of about 150 knots and the high speed of about Mach 3, at every speed in between. The back half of the canard acts as a flap, addressing the challenge of implementing flaps on an extreme delta wing design. Now, let's talk about the windshield on this airplane. It has unique features for supersonic flight. The outer windscreen on the XB-70 serves as a ramp that transitions up and down. At slow speeds, it transitions down into the nose to provide the pilots with a forward view. At high speeds, it comes back up, covering the inner windscreen for aerodynamic purposes, isolating the crew compartment. Moving on to the wheels, the front gear of the XB-70 has silver tires made by BF Goodrich. These tires are special, featuring a heat-resisting compound to withstand temperatures up to 360 degrees Fahrenheit. The silver-painted compound is infused throughout the tire, and they are cooled by a mixture of ethylene glycol circulating through brazed tubes inside the wheel well. Now, let's shift our focus to the rear bogies of the XB-70, where the main tires are the same as the front. There's also a smaller tire for anti-skidding, without temperature protection. This tire signals the aircraft's computers when to apply brakes. The brakes on this airplane can withstand temperatures up to about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. There was an incident where the bogies didn't work as intended during landing, but the aircraft was not lost. Compression lift is a key feature of XB-70 aerodynamics. The shockwave formation, located just at the front of the intake splitter duct, creates a shockwave that increases lift by as much as 30%. It also reduces drag, allowing the aircraft to cruise quickly at Mach numbers with lower angles of attack, saving fuel and increasing speed. Variable geometry wingtips are another crucial part of XB-70 aerodynamics. At low speeds, the wings are perfectly flat, but at low supersonic speeds, the wingtips can fold down at 25 degrees, increasing stability. At high speeds, they fold down to 65 degrees, solving stability problems and increasing lift, allowing the aircraft to operate effectively across a wide range of speeds. Another thing about the fold-down wingtips is that at high supersonic speeds, 
because they provide extra stability, they allow the relative size of the twin upper fins, the vertical fins, to be that much smaller, thereby reducing drag. This is all very clever design solutions to high-speed supersonic flight in the 1960s. One of the most remarkable features of the XB-70 is its powerful engines. At the back of the aircraft, you can see six side-by-side -side General Electric YJ-93 afterburning turbojets. Each engine develops a maximum thrust of about 30,000 pounds, and the afterburners operate continuously at super high speeds, making the XB-70 a fast and powerful aircraft. Each of those engines actually was developed as, well, a single engine for another single engine fighter project, which was canceled. But putting six of them together, same engine, gives this airplane its tremendous speed. You can see modern examples of something like this. For example, today's B-1B has four of the same approximate types of engines that the single engine F-16 fighter has. So think of a B-1 in terms of power as about four F-16s. Same with this thing, it's got six fighters worth of power. Examining the trailing edge of the XB-70 swings, we find a series of elevons, serving as a combination of ailerons and elevators. These elevons are split into six segments on either side of the engine bay, operated by 24 separate hydraulic jacks. The elevons play a crucial role in providing lateral and longitudinal stability. It was a complex airplane. Like other airplanes of its era, it was full of analog dials and gauges. And so every pilot knows that there's a, a kind of a habit, a system of scanning the instruments to make sure that everything's okay. Well, think of that job inside the XB-70. Six engines. A flight regime anywhere from 150 knots to Mach 3 with high-speed crews at Mach 2 or Mach 3 preferable for the airframe and the engines. Plus, you've got a control system that is dependent on these forward canards, elevons in the back, folding wingtips, and so on. So this is not your average airplane to fly. Um, it was perhaps a little tricky and unusual, However, the seven people who flew that aircraft were well acquainted with unusual flying situations in unusual vehicles. The crew accommodations in the XB-70 might be unexpected. Despite being a fast, high-altitude aircraft, the crew cabin was air-conditioned in a shirt-sleeves environment, maintaining a temperature between 70 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit at any speed. In the event of decompression at high altitude, each crew member had a separate clamshell enclosure for safety. The XB-70's technological facet includes its steel honeycomb structure. Notably, it was the first widespread use of stainless steel in a honeycomb panel structure.
about 69% of the aircraft's weight, totaling 150,000 pounds, is comprised of welded stainless steel honeycomb panels, covering wings, engine box, center fuselage, fins, rudders, and the forward part of the canards. Additionally, the forward fuselage and aft plane are constructed from titanium alloys. The second XB-70 was tragically lost in a mid-air collision during a photo mission in the summer of 1966. The collision with an F-104 resulted in the loss of the XB-70, and only one remains in existence today. The XB-70, its wing was damaged and both vertical stabilizers were gone, and it flew on for only a couple of seconds before it became uncontrollable. And uh, its co-pilot, uh, Major Carl Cross, died, unfortunately, and the North American uh, pilot, uh, Al White, ejected from the XB-70, but uh, he was badly injured. But that's how the airplane was lost. That's why there's only one XB-70 now. The XB-70 was supported at Edwards Air Force Base, and the museum's XB-70, the first one made, landed at Wright Field. The talents required to design the XB-70 included a combination of talent and persistence, as it was designed without modern supercomputer modeling. The engineers and designers of the 1950s had to think through high-speed aerodynamic problems, resulting in the unique features of the XB-70. One of the most amazing factoids about the XB-70 is that even though the airplane looks like the latest, sleekest, modern airplane, it's two years older than the original Star Trek. The airplane first flew in 1964, and Captain Kirk was not in orbit until 1966. Lieutenant Colonel Fitz Fulton, with 63 flights and 124 hours of flight time in the XB-70, is a notable personality connected with the aircraft. The XB-70's heritage is not only about its technical history but also a story of technological progress, breaking barriers, and creating tools for the Air Force to protect the country. In conclusion, the XB-70 Valkyrie remains a popular and iconic aircraft, not only for its technical features but also for its beauty, elegance, and contribution to the history and heritage of aviation. Subscribe for more.